All right, I think we're going, but we need to give it a second to connect. Mm -hmm. All, right. <laughs> All right, let me know, Nelson, when we're, it's, on. we're on. Okay, we're good. <laughs> Hi, guys, how are you? Hi. Excellent. Um, maybe we should just do introductions first. I am Veronica Ross. I am the author of Divergent and other books, including Part of the Mark, and then most notably, Chosen Ones, which we all have, <laughs> <laughs> since we all worked on it. Uh, and yeah, okay, your turn. Joe. I'm Jo Volpe. I am a literary agent. I work with Veronica, who is here on my screen. I don't know where she is for the rest of you guys. And uh, among many other authors, and I was one of the first people to read the first iteration of Chosen Ones, which was really exciting. And then I shared it with John. So take it away, John. <laughs> uh, I'm John Joseph Adams. Uh, I'm, I'm Veronica's editor, and uh, I'm, I'm, I edit John Joseph Adams' books at Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Um, I've also edited, um, I came from short fiction, so I edited about 30 anthologies, and actually anthologies is where um, Veronica and I first uh, connected. Uh, I had invited her to, to write a story for uh, Wasteland's New Apocalypse, which uh, came out last year, um, and uh, so that was very cool, and then um, of course I was very excited when I got the proposal for Chosen Ones. John, uh, I am being told that you are a little harder to hear. Oh, okay. Uh, let me see. Let me move my mic forward. Yeah. Everything was fine until we started being live. I know, I know. Um, okay, I think also we should be good. Also, the gain on it. <laughs> yeah, turn up that gain. Um, all right, hello to everyone who is tuning in and in the chat. Um, all right, so I thought it would be fun to start where I started, which is with the idea for Chosen Ones. So I'll give a quick rundown of what the book is about, for people who don't know. And I'm just going to hold this up one more time like Vanna White. <laughs> um, anyway, the book is about, uh, thanks, Joe. <laughs> um, the book is about a group of people who defeated a dark lord figure known as the Dark One when they were teenagers and they saved the world. Now it's 10 years later and, um, you know, the world doesn't stay saved for long. <laughs> so that's kind of what it's about. But they're also, you know, more famous than anyone ever. Um, and dealing with some of the psychological repercussions of having gone through such an ordeal as young people. So that is what Chosen Ones is about. Um, I don't really remember the exact moment that the idea appeared, um, but mm -hmm. it was in early 2017. So that's like when I thought of it. And originally, I think I conceived of the idea as Sloan being the Chosen One's girlfriend instead of because I think I was talking to some friends like, you know, we get these these great Chosen One stories and a lot of us, a lot of the writer friends that I have really enjoy that trope as a lot of people who like science fiction fantasy do. Um, but you don't get to hear like what happens to the girlfriend <laughs> um, or the boyfriend, you know, like the love interest in general. But um, then I realized I didn't really want to write about that because then it would just be sort of a more straightforward chosen one story like she wasn't the she wasn't it before and now she is Woo. um and so i decided to make them all chosen ones and it was at that point that i talked i was talking to joe about like what we were going to do in the coming months um with my career and whatnot and i said well what if i wrote this book that i think is actually for adults um because I'd already kind of figured out the idea for it. And then I sent you this email, <laughs> uh, which I will pull up right now on my phone. <laughs> um, and I, oh no, of course my phone is being insane right now at this very second. Great, can't pull it up. Um, but I basically sent you the outline for it. Hold on, I'm gonna see if I can get it somewhere else. Um, synopsis. Oh, there it was. Sorry, guys. This is like not a great time for this. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I said, uh, hello, not urgent, of course, but attached is the synopsis for that adult sci-fi fantasy project I was telling you about. It's messy and probably confusing, but as you are one of the best brainstormers ever, I decided to give up and just send it to you. Um, and then the synopsis, which I reread, is surprisingly similar to 
what like the structure is the same. Um, a lot of the details have changed. It seemed like initially it was going to be way more of like a sort of high fantasy like portal situation. Um, and then somewhere along the line, I decided to put it in alternate Chicago instead. But so a lot of things in this synopsis are um, mm -hmm. more fantasy, like more leaning into the fantasy angle of it, um, which is interesting. But Joe, why don't you, <laughs> why don't you tell us <laughs> what happened from there? Um, I'm pretty sure I read it in like a couple of days and was like, all right, I read it and here, we should set a call. I have lots of thoughts. And I, I, when you had brought up that old chain to me, I looked at the notes again and I was like, oh, wait, like some of these notes we ended up incorporating in some way. Can you um, think of an example of one? Probably, what was one? I, I, I probably have to think about it. I know we, we did, there was a training montage in the original where I was like, let's cut the training montage. We've done that really well in other things. <laughs> I love a training montage. <laughs> Can't resist it. <laughs> Maybe we can talk to Picture Start about keeping that in the movie because oh, everyone yeah. <laughs> loves to take montage on screen. Um, so, uh, but there were a couple of other items. I think I we had talked about um, we was boyfriend, but then we said maybe we should talk about it being a fiance or something about their relationship feeling like it was over, um, yeah. which is not a spoiler because it kind of opens the book with that. Uh, Sloan, the main character, and her partner, Matt, who was also, they were both chosen ones, and, and so I said that kind of, I think, feels like more of an adult um, approach to their relationship, like this feeling of an ending of a romantic relationship that's been going on for a really long time, and you feel like you're kind of trapped in it for various reasons, so that was one I remember I had mentioned, and I, you did end up incorporating, but not in the way I expected, and <laughs> I liked it. So, <laughs> so what, what so why did you decide to send it to John? I mean, so we did go out to multiple editors, but John in particular, I remember when we talked about the submission list and I was like, you know, John's great. My experience with him had only been on short fiction that up to that point, but I was like, I just feel like he's going to love this. And his imprint is a, a genre, sci-fi fantasy imprint, which is your first and foremost love. And it was kind of like, this would be such a great home for it because the, the books that he publishes are just so damn fun. And I think that you would like being there. And I think that's, you did end up saying that later too <laughs> about his list and after you guys spoke. So, um, so that's why I went to John with it. And I was so glad that he did like it as much as I thought he would. <laughs> yeah. Um, and okay. <laughs> I know I'm like trying to, I'm trying to moderate this, but of course we've had some this is a bit of a last minute thing. So thank you guys for joining me on short notice. Um, but John, how do you, um, how do you approach like getting things on submission? What makes something stand out to you or I'm just curious in general? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, a lot of times it's uh, the voice. I think the voice is the hardest thing for writers to get right and to, to do differently in, in a way that's interesting and, and sort of grabby. Um, and then otherwise, I, I think uh, basically, uh, comes down to like, you know, uh, you, different take on a, a plot. Like, you know, there's only so many plots, but um, you know, you can reinvent them in inf interesting ways and flip things on their heads and, uh, you know, take a take a trope and, and make me look at it in a new way. And if you can do that, like in, in like the first chapter or the you know, description or something, um, and, and then you have like an interesting character, like that's usually what will first grab me. But um, I think it always starts with the voice um, just because it's like, that's the easiest thing to like, to, to, to be a flag of like, this writer isn't for me because, you know, I got to spend uh, 300 pages or more or 400, 500 pages with this book. And so it's like, I really got to love that voice in my head. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so I think that's it. You know, that's interesting because when people ask me why I keep setting books in Chicago, mm -hmm. I, I've tried to come up with like sophisticated answers to that question. But actually, it's because I like it here. <laughs> and mm -hmm. Because when you write a book, you spend, I mean, like a year or two years living in a place in your mind. And mm -hmm. so it better be something that you like. So it's kind of sim this, a similar feeling, I think. Like, I better uh, be okay with spending a lot of time in this place. Basically. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, oh, and I was just going to say, uh, I remember when Joe first sent the book over to me. Um, I, I know I read it right away because I was like, oh, well, shit, Veronica. Ro oh, sorry. I don't know if I should swear on this, but uh, I, I no, swear all the time. So I apologize in advance. I mean, this isn't on television. So, yeah. you know, we're, this is the internet. Everything, yeah. everything, anything goes, right? Um, but uh, I, uh, I remember I read it right away because I was like, oh, dang, Veronica Roth book. I got to check out that. Check out that. And because, uh, A, I was excited just because it was you. But then also I was like, I know people are going to be, uh, you know, uh, salivating over this so I better jump all over it um and, and so uh, so I know I read it right away and I like got back to her as soon as I had like a vibe on it like I don't remember if I read the whole thing I don't remember how long the the, the um proposal was but I know I, I I communicated some early enthusiasm I like to do that when I'm excited about something um and then I, I know I remember uh this happened right around the time uh, Avengers Infinity War was coming out because uh when we were actually doing the auction uh it was the, actually the day that it came out, uh, or at least, or the day, or maybe it was like, maybe it came out on Thursday and the auction was on Friday, but I was going to see it the day that the auction was happening. And so I was actually in like the, the next, the next town over where we go to our, go to the theater. And I, we were like killing time in a bookstore. And like, I thought that this was going to be over by the time the movie started because I'm on the West coast. And so I'm on the East coast, like, Oh, it's going to be wrapped up by then. I don't have to worry about this. And so my wife and I are just like killing time in the bookstore. And I'm like, Oh my God, like everything's happening right now. And, and I had came to a point where I was like, uh, we can't go to the movie. I gotta, I can't be in, no! I, can't, I can't be in lockdown for, for three hours while this is all happening. I might need to reply to something. And, uh, so yeah, so we had to go see in front of the war, like the, or, uh, uh, the next day or something. Um, oh, so. wow. I really feel the dedication now. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Knew that I did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, and the dedication is actually, uh, there's even another layer to it because uh, uh, you can't see it right there, but there's actually a Silver Surfer poster right there. And the original Infinity Gauntlet was totally my jam, like back in the day, like I love the Infinity Gauntlet. It's like, I, I, I like evangelize for it all the time. And um, Silver Surfer is not in the movie, obviously, because of rights BS, but Silver Surfer was very influential in the original Infinity Gauntlet. So the fact that it was finally being made into a movie was like just crazy to me. So I love Chosen Ones that much that I blew <laughs> off Infinity War after 20 years of, 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 of imagining it in my head. Everyone watching, this is how nerds show appreciation. <laughs> <laughs> we miss yeah. all things. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love that. Um, Someone in the chat asked a question that I think is good. Kelly Laura Pollard said, um, Veronica, Joanna, and John, what makes a strong voice in your opinion? Mm. This is such a hard question <laughs> it's to answer, I think. I will say that voice is probably one of the hardest things to teach someone. Mm. You know, it's the kind of thing that a writer just has to keep writing and reading and writing and reading until they grow like their their confidence actually just needs to grow for them to have a strong grasp of the voice of their characters. Mm -hmm. I think writers maybe naturally start out having characters who kind of sound like an amalgamation of other characters that exist in books that they've read, which is fine. Like you need to start there to get to where you go, you know, where you, to get to where you have to be as a writer. So it's the hardest thing to teach because voice is supposed to be different. It's supposed to be distinct. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be as unique as every single person that you know and when you think about them and you think about their voice, like they feel very unique and distinct as people. That's what has to come across on the page. And it's really, that is really a hard thing to, mm -hmm. to learn and to do. And some people are more, are naturally more gifted at it than others. But even the people who have that kind of natural talent for it have to actually work very hard to hone that talent and get better at it. Cause mm -hmm. you know, no one comes in having the, like being the best at voice in every book they've ever written forever right you know and so i think that that yeah i don't know if that answered the question mm -hmm. i don't know if john veronica's gonna add yeah for me um i just i think that's that was great and also it is very hard to kind of figure out and define but i had one moment in college that helped me a lot with this so i'm going to share it in case it helps someone else which is that i was in i took uh i had one professor i really liked and i basically like stalked her through all of college, she was like, I think you've taken every class that I teach. And I was like, mm, interesting, yes. Um, <laughs> anyway, so she, I, I was in her creative nonfiction class and I'd written this essay um, about something. And 
she circled one of the paragraphs near the end and it was like the most simple and straightforwardly written paragraph and she said this is the good writing um in this piece and it was a really helpful moment for me because i had believed that in order to be a quality writer you have to write poetically and beautifully and lyrically and some people can do that um but i am not one of those people so <laughs> I think hearing that from her, someone I respected so much that I could in fact sound the way it is natural for me to sound, um, it really propelled me forward. And when I wrote Divergent, it came to me so easily, I think, because um, I finally allowed myself to write that way. And I think, Joe, you probably uh, were influential in this too, because I had sent you the manuscript I wrote before Divergent, and you had a lot of notes about how to tighten it up writing wise and yeah. so these two things kind of collided and um anyway so i think when you're trying to figure out what your voice is as a writer you can often think about letting go of these preconceived notions you have of what makes a writer good because if you're trying to force it it's not going to work um and you can write well and write simply or mm -hmm. lyrically or whatever and you mm -hmm. can write poorly in those ways too so um, don't be so narrow in your definitions is my writer advice. Right. Yeah, I agree. It's I agree with what you both were saying, and especially that it's extremely hard to teach voice. Um, I mean, I think one of the things you can do is you find writers that have interesting voices and have voices that are the kind that you would like to emulate and read as much of them as you can and try if you can try try to figure out what it is that they're doing that is appealing to you. Um, and I mean, I think uh, like, so like somebody like Kelly Link, for instance, has a very distinct voice. And so if you can find writers like that, you can like read those and like try to, you know, try to figure out what it is that appeals to you. Um, but otherwise, I think um, like if you're a writer, if you're a younger writers or, or sort of a newer writer struggling to develop voice, I think like one of the easy things you can try is just sort of an exercise is like even if you're writing a, if you want to write a third person story, just try writing it as if it was first person and then just go like change the pronouns after and like get it into your head that it's like, you know, the, you're telling a story. And so you want the voice to feel natural when, you know, you're reading a paragraph. It's like, you know, obviously not every paragraph is going to be smooth as silk, but you know, you want it to be as like, like have ac an actual voice as much as possible. That, I mean, that's why we call it voice. Um, but, you know, um, you know you, if you just get that sort of, you get the rhythms of actual language, like how people talk into your head, uh, you know, that doesn't always work 100% in prose, you know, I mean, it's a kind of a refining process, but it's a good place to start and then to, to, to learn how to develop it. And then as, as you grow as a writer, you know, the rhythms and, uh, you know, you know, the rhythms of a sentence just sort of, get ingrained in your head and it's like it's 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 like one of those things that you learn by osmosis i think like where it's like really hard to point out the individual lessons but it, if you do the if you do the work you know basically read 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 um you know i, I think that kind of stuff sort of absorbs into you mm -hmm. great well i have another question that's maybe more joe focused which mm -hmm. is um uh sj little in the twitch chat says for all of you I am on my fifth revision and struggling with letting it go to the query trenches. <laughs> Advice for knowing when to let it go. So, um, Joe, I'm sure you get a lot of submissions that you're like, wow, that's not ready. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you describe what that is like? What makes you know that something isn't, isn't quite ready? Um, so um, the way I receive submissions is that the way they're called a query, and a query is essentially a pitch letter. Um, it's breaking down your story into three to four paragraphs, um, and as if you were pitching your whole, you know, 90,000 words to somebody in three to four paragraphs, so one letter. Um, and so I received that, and then New Leaf also receives five, the first five pages of a book. So that's all we see initially. And so when I know something isn't ready, when I from a query standpoint, it's, first of all, if the, if the query is really sloppy, and what I mean by sloppy is riddled with spelling errors, or they misspelled my name, or got sent it to me with the wrong name, that sounds like a silly, like a petty thing. It's actually not, because that kind of attention to detail, um, or lack of, in that instance, tells me what kind of writer they're going to be in terms of their research and how they apply it to their work. 
So that's a quick, like, this is a not, this writer is not ready for the professional space yet. Um, but when you get into someone like they've written a great query letter, it's the, the pitch itself is really strong. And then I get to the pages. I think what the, a few indicators to me that something isn't quite there yet is if they feel like they need to start with a lot of backstory. It, mm. it, if they, the first five pages are filled with, this is what happened before so that you can understand what's happening now. And I'm not saying, I know that movies open up a lot of times with like a flashback scene or even TV shows or whatever it be, but, and, and I'm not saying books never do, but for the most part, I should be able to be oriented and, ha and be able to follow your character and have the lay of the land enough to keep turning the page to the next one to learn more without you having to explain everything to me. Mm -hmm. They call those info dumps and that could either be backstory or just like world building detail so that I understand how that mechanism, that machine works, like getting into the mechanics and gears of the machine. I don't need to necessarily know all that unless it's something that is crucial to the plot moving forward. But to me, that shows that someone hasn't figured out where their story starts yet, or they're just not confident in their ability to bring the reader along without needing to explain everything. Um, and so those are, that's probably a big one. You know, um, I mean, I admit to something like vaguely sacrilegious, but uh, I, when I was younger, used to just skip the prologue because <laughs> I always thought it was like, well, this is optional, right? <laughs> right. Totally. Um, and I do hear that a lot. Like they say not to start with a prologue, but I really need mine. And I'm like, I don't believe you. <laughs> um, that's kind of my feeling toward writers. Like there's, I've never met a prologue that I couldn't repurpose into some other thing. I've mm. You know, with Carve the Mark, especially, like, I had my editor for that book told me to cut 100 pages of the beginning. And I was like, how? <laughs> Catherine, how? And um, and I did it. And people, I mean, still think the beginning is slow. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, what I'm saying is it hurts, but you can get rid of it, <laughs> like, most of the time. Yeah. And then to answer the question of when do you know, like if you're doing five revisions, I don't know where this person is in their submission process yet. But what I would say is if you've gone out on multiple rounds of submissions to agents for various iterations and revisions of your work, and, and I think multiple rounds, like let's say three, um, three where you've hit up at least 10 agents each time. And it's just, you're not getting any bites and um, you're getting no feedback. Like usually if something is promising the agent will give feedback. That's what I did on Veronica's first one. I was like, I really like her as a writer. Mm -hmm. uh, this isn't ready, here's some notes. Please send me your next thing and thank God she did. So I'm not going about that. But right. like truly, like that's what you, that's what agents will do. If, they, if there's something there, they'll give notes. But if you're not getting any feedback, any notes, it might be time to set it aside. Now, I will tell you just because someone turns on your first thing doesn't mean that they won't sign you for something else. That's obviously what happened with Veronica and I. And that was, that timeline was really close. I have another client that I signed um, in 2018, and uh, her book, she talks about this, her book just came out this year, uh, Lobo Taipei. I had received a submission from her in, I think, 2008, might be 2009. It was, I was still getting physical submissions, so I mailed it back to her, so I had no record of it. But mm -hmm. anyway, I sent her a bunch of notes and said, like, keep going, like, you're like it's worth you, like I, whatever it was, it was my version of like, keep going, you're doing well, I have these notes, I would see something from you again. 10 years later, I signed her. Wow. And I was like, oh my God, it, it just, it's funny, but it just shows like she did keep going and it was fine. And she had multiple manuscripts in between them that hadn't, you know, found a home. So, and now uh, she's a bestseller. So, oh, yay. Wow. Happy story. That's so, great. So oh, just keep going, it's okay to put things aside. Right. Uh, I was just going to say about prologues. Uh, uh, so I don't, I don't, I don't share the uh, the distaste for them in, in general. I mean, I, sometimes I agree they they are unnecessary, but uh, they don't really bother me that much. But one of the things that I always think is funny is that because um, publishing knowledge has become like don't have a prologue. I see these novel submissions where it's like people put a prologue in, they just call it chapter one, and I'm like. That's not chapter one, guys. It's still a prologue, even if you don't call it a prologue. Like, you're just cheating. Um, yeah. and when you write papers in college and you just make the margins a little bigger. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right. 
so so it's like that's totally cheating but and also one thing i thought was very uh interesting once i uh you know started the novel imprint hmh's uh general practice for uh numbering prologues would be to put roman numerals on it and i'm like wait why this is the beginning of the book like it's like what you were saying, Veronica. It's like, you know, as, as a younger reader, it's like you thought like, oh, well, this is optional. I can just skip this, right? It's like, if you put Roman numerals on it, people are definitely going to think they should skip it. Yeah. You know? So, um, no, no, put wow. page number one. It's page one. Yeah. Wow. Um, I really hate to tell you this, John, but I think your microphone is not helping you as much as you'd like. <laughs> huh. I'm sorry. I'm just reporting what the people tell me. Huh. Um, I also, okay. I'm gonna turn up the game more. How about now? Is it better now? I don't know. Our chat I, found I can delay. move it right here. Okay, Nelson says it sounds fine, so I think we're okay. Okay, all right. Great. I'm gonna have it right here. Oh, that's perfect. That sounds a oh. lot better. Yeah. Okay, good. Sorry about that. Okay. I have this fancy mic. I thought I would know how to use it by now. It's not bad. I think it's probably, I mean, we're multiple layers of video chat right now, so yeah. I think it's just yeah. that. Um, I had something to ask, and I've lost it. Oh, I wanted to know, John, if you remember, um, I, I thought it would be interesting to give some examples of like what kind of edits you'll do mm -hmm. at, uh, when a book is this far along. You mm -hmm. know? Um, so do you remember specifically any of the big things about Chosen Ones when, in the mm -hmm. early stages that we uh, we both agreed on to change. Right, right. Um, I don't, I, I'm having trouble remembering any specifics. Right. Um, I, know, I know offhand that we definitely talked about adding a lot more world building stuff um, and, and, and making the mag magic system sort of more rigorous um, in terms, I mean, that kind of goes hand in hand with the, with the world building, but um, yeah, I just felt like, uh, I felt like it, the magic system needed more development from that initial job. So of course the book was finished. It was just a, you know, synopsis and sample chapters. So it was like, well, of course, um, you know, but uh, I thought that was something that would be very important to, uh, you know, the adult genre readers uh, who, who often like nitpick these things. And so, uh, and of course, and I mean, it's important to me as a reader too. So, um, and I think it just makes it into a better book. Um, and I mean, I think you did a great job with it in the end. Thanks. Um, yeah, you're welcome. Um, I, I actually, uh, so one of my favorite things in the book is, uh, there's, there's a, there's, you know, there's all these interstitials in the book that, um, that are like sort of nonfiction articles in between the chapters. Uh, I mean, they're obviously fiction, but you know, they're presented as sort of nonfiction. And so there's this one, there's this one like sort of magic scholar who coins the, the phrase, the manifestation of impossible wants. And like, that's basically how magic works is that it's like, you, you have to like, you have to like really want something to happen. Uh, in, in this world. And so um, I, I, my one regret is that it's like, I, I was like, oh, but maybe we could call the book that. It's such a great phrase. It's like, <laughs> we gotta call something that. You gotta write a short story set in this world called that or something. Um, well, I mean, maybe. it's more of a short story title for sure. Um, Me and Joe are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, know. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, it's such a great title. And I was like, and, you know, even as I suggested, I was like, well, I mean, it doesn't really seem like it fits this book. It's like, it kind of sounds more lofty than this book is, like more sort of yeah. like, like, like world changing literary masterpiece, you know, which I mean, you know, like this is more of a commercial book, you know, but uh, I mean, yeah. it's very, it's like, I love it, you know, but you know, it's like, you know, we want to make sure that people think it is what it is, you know, and not think it's something else. So. Yeah. Um, I mean, it is important to have a title that communicates what you're actually going to get when you open yeah, the book. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> I yeah. get it. <laughs> right. But yeah, that's Arthur Solowell's yes. piece in the book. Yeah, he's I've my favorite. Lots of fake names in this book. Um, right. Yeah. Oh, but speaking of the title, I, I one of the things I was very happy with was that we added the S. We made chosen ones plural because uh, I believe the original proposal was just the chosen one. The chosen and, one, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and so like I and of course with every with there being five chosen ones, I I, I really kind of felt like that was important, and plus it would help distinguish the book from other things that are called chosen one. Um, you know, I mean, there is a very slight distinction, but I was like, okay, I I really and so I was very happy that we went with that. Yeah. Um, and plus we lost the the right. Yes, yeah. although yes, we did lose the the. I still sometimes call it that, which is not yeah. bad. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, Jarvis writes from the Twitch chat says, could you all go over what happens in the life of a book from writing to publishing, as in what the exact job of each of you is and how mm -hmm. do you collaborate? 
Mm -hmm. Um, well, my job <laughs> <laughs> is to come up with the idea and then to write it and to revise it hmm. and then to promote it. <laughs> so yeah. did I miss anything? Um, Joe? <laughs> um, so I, I, yeah, no, you got it. Uh, I, my job would be to assess the ideas of my authors, usually not just the idea, the idea plus pages of some kind to see, to kind of assess its sellability, and we'll talk about that. And then my job after that is to find it the best home, so I sell it, um, but it's also a bit of a matchmaking thing. So one of the reasons I went to John is because I was like, I actually think they would get along, because mm. that's like a creative relationship. <laughs> yeah, as people, because the creative relationship between an author and editor is so important. So it's selling it, but selling it to the, the right house that can support the author in the way they need to be supported and the right editor that can creatively um, be a creative match that would bring the book to it, into its best version of itself. And then negotiate the deal, negotiate the contract, and after that, kind of support the author in the other stages of the process. So as they revise, there is a second, you know, a brainstorm partner or just someone to vent to or whatever as they need. And then when they're promoting the same thing. So that's kind of, yeah, that's it. Yeah. I describe an agent as, <clears throat> sorry, just like always being on your team, mm -hmm. um, which is just an impossibility for someone who works for a publisher because, mm -hmm. you know, there's competing obligations there. So the right. agent is there to like make sure that an author mm -hmm. is supported no matter what, um, which is, doesn't mean that they're at odds with the editor, obviously, <laughs> since we right. all work together. Um, but it just, you know, in some situations are not as pleasant and easy mm -hmm. as ours has been. And so mm -hmm. that's uh, just informationally for writers right. who are curious. Um, yeah, and sometimes, yeah, sometimes you need an agent to be the bad guy for you so that you can maintain your good relationship with your editor. But you know, it's like you have a thing that needs to be discussed and it's like, it's awkward. And so it's like your agent can do that and, and handle that. Um, and um, also I was just gonna say in the subject of your agent always being on your team, one awkward thing for me, that's just as a side note, you know, I also edit anthologies and as an anthology editor, I'm treated like an author is because it's like, I'm, my name goes on the, on the front of the book as the anthology editor. And then I write a proposal and we pitch it to publishers and then they, so they sort of buy it like they would a novel. Um, and so because of that, I have an agent, uh, you know, representing me for that stuff. And Seth, Seth Fishman uh, of Gernert Company. Um, and so, yeah, he's great. And, and so, and so one of the funny things is that, well, he's always on my team as an anthology editor, but sometimes he's on the other team when like we're buying a book or whatever. Cause like, you know, I've bought some books that he's represented. And so it's like, I mean, and it's all fine, you know, just that it's like, it's a little awkward. Cause like, well, sometimes we're, sometimes we're on the same exact team. And sometimes we're like, well, we're competing a little bit here. We're kind of on side, side teams, you know? Yeah. Um, which I guess is just an argument for being like a decent and professional <laughs> person no matter what <laughs> yes exactly you never know <laughs> right right um but so so for my job uh you know as the editor uh i consider my my primary role to be the curator uh because uh my I, I feel like my most important decisions are always like what books am i going to acquire for the imprint like what what books among the you know thousands of things that i see are worth actually publishing and that we need to pursue um and I actually have a little bit of a different um, position than most editors. Like a lot of editors, like, uh, or mo I think basically almost all editors at publishing houses, it's like uh, they have a lot of meetings to go to and they have to do profit and loss statements to figure out like how much money a book's gonna be offered for and everything. And so in my case, I, I'm, um, I don't work in house at the company. I, you know, I live in California and they're in uh, New York and Boston. Um, and so, the way HMH has this set up where like with these, with folks like me who have like a name imprint, you know, my name's on the imprint. Um, it's designed to make me focus much more on the author and the work. And so somebody else at HMH does the business administrative side of, you know, the editorial job that normally an editor would do. Uh, so I don't have all the details on that, except. <laughs> yes, that the book. Very fancy. <laughs> um, yeah, and they even uh, make, gave us a little colophon now uh, with the with the little JJA and the swooping rocket. It's nice. Oh. Uh, Got to get a tattoo of that. That's um, great. But, uh, oh yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, but so yeah, and I mean, so that's like, I, I consider that my primary job is to, to curate the list. Um, and then I have to fight for the books, uh, you know, in-house, like, you know, make sure we make sure we offer on the things that I def desperately want to offer on uh, and all that. And then um, and then once we acquire the book, you know, I have to work with the author to, um, you know, to make it the best book that, that it can be. Um, and, you know, that entails like reading it multiple times, going over it line by line. Um, I always work in track changes in, in Word. And so um, I'll. Uh, I'll, I'll sort of make changes with the track changes to say like I think it should be more like this like with the understanding being that like I'm not I'm not saying like I'm not changing this I'm just saying like I think it should be more something like this and it's just the easiest way to communicate it and if you think it fine like it is then you can just accept it and then great I did some of the work for you um, <laughs> but, and, and then and then otherwise leaving the, uh, the little comment balloons uh, in the margins um, and and actually Veronica and I sort of got to know each other a little bit through the through the comments because like sometimes authors like when you do multiple rounds sometimes authors they just sort of fix the thing and they don't say anything but like Veronica often would reply to a thing and like and like even if I just like made a comment that was just like a, a joke or a, a, I was just like saying something was awesome or whatever it's like she would reply to the comments and so like we kind of had a conversation going in the track changes and so that was kind of fun we did, and in the um, acknowledgments, I think this is a good time to bring this up. <laughs> I said to you something about, hold on, not using your joke. Yeah. <laughs> did you see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think no, I think you were, I think it was the opposite. I, uh, you, you thought we should have used the zombie joke I suggested you cut, and and uh, or something like that, right? No, you had a replacement. You were like, oh, or okay. you could do a joke about him losing his nose, <laughs> or okay. something. I, something. Oh, right, yeah, because I think. I've, <laughs> yeah, I think I think I had a Tico Brahe uh, reference or something. Yeah. Um, anyway, I yeah. I in the acknowledge just for people watching, I yeah. in the acknowledgments say I'm sorry we didn't use your excellent zombie joke. Oh yeah. We did yeah, do yeah. a different one. I mean, zombies are like ripe for puns. Also, if you're wondering why there are zombies in this book, just wait. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes sense. Brahe. There are reasons. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, um. Okay, uh, someone, oh, Alex Dania in the chat asked, is the Chosen Ones the first of a series you're planning, Veronica, or a standalone? Do you have ideas or plans for a sequel? And did you write the book with that in mind? I wanted to talk about this because I remember at the end of the book, John you being like, are you sure that there is a sequel? <laughs> <laughs> um, because it felt very, like, ended. Uh, and I think that is kind of an interesting question, like, whether this feels like it you know you we've all read like books where they really shouldn't have had a sequel or <laughs> books where like this doesn't have a sequel mm -hmm. um anyway so um i wondered i don't know if there's a question in there or not i think it, <laughs> it was just interesting um mm -hmm. that but you yeah, are there, doing a sequel i yes. am doing a sequel yeah there is a, a next one and i have an outline for it um did you feel like after reading the outline that it does actually need a sequel? <laughs> <laughs> this is a terrible thing to ask on a live stream. What am I doing? <laughs> if if you didn't, anyway. Um, I okay, like the sequel idea. I yeah, think you know, I mean, I, one. yeah, and you know, I mean, I, like, I, I when I when when I said that about like how I was like, where really is there is there going to be a sequel? Because it's like, but I mean, I think I think it's actually great the way things played out because. Like once you started, once you sort of gave the gist of like what the sequel would be, it was like, oh yeah, no, that totally makes sense, you know. But, okay, good. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, but th I think that's really great that when I finished reading the book, that was the feeling that I had because you want when you finish reading a book, you actually do want it to feel really conclusive. Yeah. And I think a lot of books that have a sequel in mind, they just leave so many threads open that um, that it doesn't actually feel like 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 you came to a conclusion it's like you tied up a lot of things but then there's just so much left over that it's like it's not really complete and like you feel like you have to read the next book yeah. whereas like you obviously you want everybody to want to read the next book but you don't want to feel like to get a complete experience that they have to read this other thing you want them to read this book have a complete experience have it be awesome which i think it will be when people read this i mean that, that's how i felt about it and so um you know, I think, I think that's, that, that's really great. And it's like, so if you can write a book like that and then actually come up with a sequel that works, like that's like kind of the best situation you can imagine. Yeah, I have ended books on cliffhangers before mm -hmm. and it did not feel good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like sometimes it was necessary. It's kind of exciting right. in the middle of a series, like Insurgent, I think ends on the biggest cliffhanger. 
right. both those three books. Um, and I am pretty determined not to do that hmm. anymore. Right. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I mean, it's not it's not like books that do that don't work. I mean, there's plenty of books that that definitely are the middle book of a series and they're great. You know, it's just that it's like it's if you're talking about best of all worlds, it's like which is kind of apropos for this book, um, which not really best of all worlds depicted here but you know whatever um <laughs> you know uh you know um if we're talking best of all worlds uh it, yeah it's like that's just the ideal because it's like you can you can just read that one book and have this wonderful experience and then ideally like it'll be such a great experience that when the next book comes out you're just gonna well, i'm just gonna have to read it even though i was completely satisfied by what happened in this one rather than oh i have to read the next one because i just gotta find out what happened you know so it's like a different sort of expectation and i just feel like the you know, it's like there's just two different types of books, really. So, yeah. and 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 the the former is way fewer on the ground. Like, there's way fewer books that do that. So, it's it's more impressive when 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 it happens. <laughs> um, I agree. Joe, someone asked about our our journey to find each other <laughs> in the chat earlier. I don't remember yeah. who it was. Um, and I thought it'd be fun to tell the story of how you made the offer <laughs> on hmm. Divergent because it was during that power outage. Remember? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. So you heard, everyone heard that I, or everyone who's here heard that I had read a previous manuscript and I was like, please send me your next thing when it comes in. Um, and the next thing was Divergent and it came in and it was, it, it was, I mean, I mean, when I tell you, it was almost this, I feel like it was almost the same, but it got longer. You added a lot more to the middle after editing it. Yeah. But like the beginning and end, I think are almost exactly the same. I don't think anything has changed. Anyway, I love that book, and I read it, and there was a powder outage, and I was trying to remember what caused this outage recently. Was, I don't... was it not Hurricane Katrina? Hmm. Maybe? It was a significant event. Like, you what? drove to a Dunkin' Donuts parking lot. Yeah, <laughs> I did. I was like, I need to get back to this writer. <laughs> we had been staying, we weren't staying at our own place, because I think we got out of our own place because it was, like, compromised with whatever was happening weather-wise, and I, I really wish I could remember it. Um, but anyway, so my husband and I had been staying with his grandmother, and I and she didn't have power either, but it was a better scenario, whatever it was. We are sitting there, she didn't have power, so we were just like, we have to go find a place where I can talk to this person <laughs> that isn't in the dark, and it was before smartphones, or at least before I had a smartphone, so it was like, I just had my flip phone or whatever, and I was just like, I have to write down her number and like do all this stuff. I, we went and we found this Dunkin' Donuts that was like a beacon of light yeah. in an otherwise pitch dark street. I don't know, they almost had a generator. And so we just mm. pulled up in the parking lot and my husband went inside and I called Veronica and was like, it was like nighttime for me. And I was like, I want like to offer you representation. Mm. And I have notes, like, would you like to see my notes? Um, with, you know, those whatever. notes were, I mean, I liked you a lot as a person, but the notes were what told me, really. Mm -hmm. because, I'm so glad. Yeah, because I got, um, I think this is probably a good thing to say to writers who are in this chat, which is that I got two offers, two different agents, both good agents, but one said, this is ready for submission, and Joe said, here are nine single space, space <laughs> pages of notes. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and I was like, I'm pretty sure that I need nine single space pages of notes. <laughs> so um, I think it's willingness to accept feedback is something that I think a lot of young writers struggle with sometimes. It feels scary, it feels uncomfortable, it feels like someone's trying to take something that's dear to you and warp it into something that it isn't. And that is absolutely not what they are. Um, mm. So when I get notes, when I got no notes from Joe and when I got notes from you, John, um, I felt like I didn't, necessarily agree with all of them that's not mm -hmm. ever going to happen to any writer mm -hmm. but i felt like i could understand what kind of book it could be that was bigger than the book that i had written mm -hmm. and that is the reason that you should be open to feedback because other people's view of your work can help to expand your understanding of what that work can be and can mm -hmm. make your story larger than it is so i remember joe doing that with divergent it was so much shorter and it felt like such a smaller book Mm. Like the kind of book, you know, maybe it could have gotten published without those expansions, but it wouldn't have been a big deal, like the mm. way that it was. It wouldn't have even had a chance at being that. Mm. Um, it was just a quieter story. And so you helped me to make it like bigger in scope. And I think the same thing happened with Chosen Ones. It could have been mm. a quieter 
story, but then it was like, suddenly I was writing fake product reviews for the <laughs> technology and chosen ones. And I was like, right. how did we get here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very excited by it, but I don't know where, where this happened. <laughs> um, and you know, there's a lot of things I don't think about. I'm like, I didn't think about, I remember John, you asked me like, well, what are they doing with the internet here? <laughs> like, is there internet here in this world with magic? Right. Um, and that was like a huge question. Mm -hmm. It changed the whole book. It was great. Yeah. Um, well done all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me see. Actually, I was going to say, that, I mean, I think for any of the writers and uh, who are listening and like such as the person who asked the, the question, um, uh, you know, just speaking about how many edits uh, Joe gave you, I, I think that's one of the things that a lot of writers don't actually realize is like how much an, an agent um, might edit your book uh, before it goes out in submission. Um, and it's interesting as an editor to see the the agents who I know do that diligently and then to get a submission from an agent who I'm like, I, I know this person must not even like really look at anything like or, or like beyond like just read it like give it a cursory read and then like send it out because it's like, like this is like so messy and like sloppy and it's like uh, I've had actually I've had, I have, I've had um, manuscripts that were being read like around uh, HMAT, which even though they were, they were like messy, it was like I liked them, and and I would have like comments from various people saying like I can't believe the agents that let it go out like this. It's like because there's just so, like so many typos and stuff. Um, so I, I just think it's really interesting um, that how the whole process works and and how you know everybody operates differently. But yeah. Sure. But, you know, for me, at least, like, I, I look past, uh, you know, errors and stuff. Like, I, I, it doesn't bother me, really. Like, I mean, it's, it's always something like, well, that's easy to fix. Like, you know, somebody uses the wrong word here or has a typo here. That's, I can fix that easily. It's like, big structural changes. Those are hard. Those are the ones where I'm like, eh, am I up for this? Can we do this? Is it even possible? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is a problem. Okay. We're, I think we should wrap up soon. But, um, <laughs> So this is, I'm just, I swear, I'm just reading questions people have asked. It feels weird because I'm like, compliment my book. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> someone asked, uh, Meredith asked, John, do you have a favorite scene or character in Chosen Ones? And mm. same to Joanna or and Veronica. Mm -hmm. I do. So this might be a good end of chat question. Right, right, right. Um, uh, let's see, favorite. Um, I mean, I really love the um, I really love the interstitials. So, like, I don't know if it's cheating to to say to say that, but like, uh, I really love the first interstitial at the beginning of part two. Well, the the interstitials that are at the beginning of part two, and I'm kind of hesitant to say what they are for spoiler reasons, but yeah, I know. Um, I'm trying to look at one is an excerpt from a children's right book, a children primer. Yeah, and like one of them is is the uh, is the Arthur Sellowell thing that we were talking about earlier. Yeah, uh, I'm pretty sure. Um, so I know I really love that. And then um, his favorite character, though, um, I mean, I, I guess probably Sloane. I mean, you know, she's just, I mean, I, I kind of default to the main character almost all the time. Like, and I always kind of think it's funny. Like, I, I've met people who, like, they never, like, the main character of a book or a series or whatever, like, is never their favorite. They always like some, like, side character. And I'm like, uh, I don't understand that really. Like, I just always, it's like, if I love a book and I, and, or, or TV show or whatever, if I love the story, it's like, well, I, probably because I love the main character. Yeah. Um, you know, but I mean, that's yeah. it. Like, yeah. Sorry. I'm with you. Yeah. Because my main character is always my favorite. And that's why I decide to make them the main character. Right. <laughs> if I right. didn't, like, I don't know. Like, my main, my favorite character in Harry Potter is Harry Potter. Like, I'm yes. <laughs> so sorry, world. Right. That's a terrible <laughs> answer. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. So um, I I do I also love Sloane. I mean I I don't always necessarily default to main character though. Although I have to love the main character if I'm into a book because mm -hmm. you're with them the whole time. But I love Sloane. She's so angry in mm -hmm. a way, like you know, like she's and she's I don't know. She's angry in a way, and that I wish I could be openly angry sometimes, uh, in the same way that she is. Um, about things, about the world, about the hand, the, the hand that she's been dealt in mm -hmm. life, whatever it be. But, um, but she's great. She's really, you never know what she's going to do next because um, she's not necessarily doing everything for altruistic reasons, <laughs> which I love. Um, there is a zombie character that I yeah. also love that I won't mm -hmm. get too much into. You'll get there, everybody. If you don't know yeah. what I'm talking about when you get there, <laughs> then we didn't read the same book. Um, yeah. But that there's one there too. Um, but the scene that I love is also one that I bring up often when we're talking about the book. 
and I don't even know if I can talk about it without spoiling mm-hmm. it, but there's a scene in which Sloane, it's a flashback to mm-hmm. her childhood. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a very pivotal moment, and, and she's already been recruited by the government, or cho- she's already been chosen, mm-hmm. and is being kind of molded and trained for the particular task of defeating the Dark One. There could have been a training montage. <laughs> oh yeah, hundred percent. Like when I see that, like I'm like, I there absolutely could have been. Um, so, but there is a scene that is so telling and explains how she came to be, how she is as an adult mm. in that one scene. Mm-hmm. And I I don't know how to talk about it, but something very tragic happens, and she is essentially left there amongst the destruction and remains of what happened as a child like adrift and that's all I will say mm-hmm. but um it's such like a, a like a, I had such a visceral reaction to that scene it clicked everything in place for me about her character and about the world and kind of also and it's very telling about our own world and kind of the position we put the the amount of pressure and responsibility we put on the shoulders of young people which I know you've talked about before Veronica many times like and kind of without thought as we're doing it I don't know I love that mm-hmm. scene <laughs> I'm glad you like it. <laughs> My favorite scene, I think, I can't even really explain any of it mm-hmm. because it's like the final, the big climactic moment. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And um, I was, I remember it so clearly. I was listening to Schism by Tool and I was <laughs> like on repeat for hours. That's nice. That's and perfect. I was just fi- like, everything was finally coming together in this like really intense way. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I don't always love climactic scenes because they're so they're so high pressure for me. You know, you got to make sure that you've done the rest of the book justice with them. But and this one took several drafts actually, mm-hmm. um, and with some very pivotal suggestions from John as usual. Mm-hmm. Um, but once I got there, it was like this is cathartic, and it is also set up properly, and mm-hmm. I just felt like okay, it works. Um, and I still, I still really enjoy that scene. So hopefully you guys do too when you guys mm. read the book. Um, but great, thank, thank you for liking my book, both of you. <laughs> oh yeah, hell yeah. I, I, just wanted, I just wanted to add. Uh, uh, so one, like we were talking about critical edits or like important edits earlier, and it's like I'll say one, the one edit that sticks in my mind is like there was something in the in that scene you're talking about the you know this ending scene like I felt like that was a really important edit obviously can't say anything about what it was um because very spoilery but uh there was a very important edit there that I think like yeah like that was really important one um and then also just in terms of like the you know the actual question um uh I just wanted to follow up so it's like I think one of my other favorite scenes is also another interstitial. It's the it's the one where um, where Sloane is having the flashback of like when she's on the ship, um, and and she has to do the dive. And it's like I That's think the same I can one say Joe that. Without... Was talking about. That's yeah. One. Oh wait, was that the same one? Yeah, I was like, I don't want to okay. talk about gotcha. it. <laughs> You're doing. Well, it I, I was think, I was you thinking. Okay, I was thinking those are two different uh, two different scenes. Okay, but. Um, oh yeah. And, Right, and then, um, but then uh, I was going to say my, I think my favorite other character besides Sloan is probably uh, Bert, uh, even though he's Bert. very, oh, very yeah. background character. It's like, you know, of, of the background characters, like he's my favorite, uh, especially like when he gets saucy in one of the, or a few, maybe a few of the uh, interstitials um, talking to superiors. Uh, so I, I like that. Yeah, there's a lot of like um, government spook chatter in the yeah, interstitials yeah. and Bert is like, uh sassy yeah (laughs) yeah i like it Um, i love how much love they have for him you know the chosen ones like and and, i mean it's a complicated relationship but i really love like that dynamic that they have yeah i'm glad you like things about this (laughs) um all right thank you so much for joining us everyone and this was great and uh yeah all right someone said show us your book again (laughs) i love seeing the book here it is Oh wait, here, I'll take the, the cover off. It'll be beautiful. Oh, yeah, Look how pretty. pretty it is. She They're says she has designed. the ebook so she doesn't get to see it. Yeah. The designs and maps, and you can see the government seal thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um there was also uh, the, the the indies that were um, Oh my god. <laughs> yes. Okay, so uh, I should have mentioned this at the beginning. That was my job 
and I forgot. Um, <laughs> but these virtual events we're doing in cooperation with some of the independent bookstores that would have um, hosted me on the tour and they would have been generous to me and supported me and so I would like to do what I can to support them too. So I know a lot of you have already bought Chosen Ones but if you have any other books that you would like to read or give as gifts um, you can definitely do that. I think this one is, uh oh, I'm losing. It's the bookworm. The bookworm. And in Omaha, a room of one's own. Blue Willow Bookshop in Texas. And the bookstall, Chicago. And also yeah. Half Price Books. Yeah, um, and Half Price Books, yeah. The bookstall is my local indie that has signed copies of my other books. I haven't gotten to sign chosen ones for them because, um, you know, I haven't been able to go in there. But yeah, consider ordering from your local indies. And if you care about indies and you have um, money to spare, which is not a situation everyone is in right now, but if you do, you can go to saveindiebookstores.com and give to that initiative, which will support independent bookstore employees who are suffering as a result of coronavirus quarantine stuff. And also the stores themselves. Um, I would like to come out of this quarantine with independent bookstores still being mm. there. So mm -hmm. I encourage you to order from these stores and support them. And yeah, thank you so much for joining us. And thanks um, everyone. Yeah, thanks John and Joe. Yeah, thanks guys. Bye. 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 Okay, the stream is done. Yay. Okay. It, was good. it still says recording though. Is that all right? Oh, I'll stop that now. <laughs>